uh, welcoming Josh Nadeau. He joined the Ottawa Dialogue as a fellow and facilitator in 2022. Uh, he holds an MA in conflict studies and was based in Eastern Europe for nearly a decade. And since 2020, he's provided research and facilitation support at the Mediation and Dialogue Research Center in Kiev, Ukraine, and has conducted dialogue projects and facilitating training across the post-Soviet -so post space. And his work also focuses on societal issues in North America, using dialogue practices to address ideological conflicts and socio-political polarization. And he hosts a dialogue series called Kitchen Talks, helps coordinate uh, the Let's Talk Ottawa initiative and offers regular workshops and training on dialogue techniques and group facilitation. And he speaks English and Russian. So we're really thrilled to have him speak about something that's really frontier work, um, pioneering and bringing the, 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 the field really forward. Now he's going to be speaking and presenting for about 20 to 30 minutes. I'd like for you, if you have questions already, to drop them in the chat, and then we'll have time for question and answers after, and we can start with some of those questions. All right, Josh, take it away. Perfect. Um, audio is still good. Perfect. Okay, I'm just going to share my screen. So thanks, everybody, for coming out. Uh, just let me know when you can see. Yeah, great. So um, today's talk is going to be on evaluating approaches, like evolving approaches to track to diplomacy. Um, but specifically, what I'm really interested in is uh, so when we think about peace building and dialogue, it's often in these uh, violent or post violent contexts. We think of war. Um, when we think of peace building, these are some images that come up. But what about these? So um, some of these images are very familiar to many of you. So we have the, the January 6th events, we have the Freedom Convoy in Canada, we have, issue, we have issues over vaccination um, and mandates, which caused a lot of different um, societal uh, polarization over the past few years. And so I'm really interested in what ways can we take some of the tools that have been developed in the peace building world and apply them to, to these kinds of conflicts. Um, and I'm sure that almost all of you have had some, uh, some encounter with, uh, with these kinds of tense conversations uh, or conflicts over the past few years in particular. So before getting into, um, there, I, I know that there's some of us in the room and we're, for whom this language of track two and peace building is kind of new. I'll get into that a little bit later, but first I wanna talk about this context of polarization, what it is and uh, what barriers it presents to people who want to work towards peace. So first off, uh, sociopolitical polarization in North America. So um, we're talking about sociopolitical polarization. It's ones that are along these party lines. Um, so by party, in the States, it's, it can be Republican or Democrat. Uh, I'm from Canada, so we don't have these uh, strict polar bipartisan lines, um, but it could also be ideological. So for example, the political right or the left, it could be liberal or conservative. Um, so we're talking about polarization along, along these lines. This doesn't mean that this is the only kind of important polarization that's, uh, that's in the world today, but, uh, um, but there's a literature that's, uh, that's displaying how intense this is becoming and what kinds of problems it does. And one thing that's interesting about this literature is that it divides uh, polarization into two different types. So the first type is this ideological polarization. Um, so how are we divided in terms of our ideas, uh, our policy preference, like how do we want the, the future to be, what vision do we have for, um, how our, for how our societies are constructed. So talking about the division that we have about those ideas, that's ideological polarization. Then there, and this is actually what most people talked about when they were speaking about polarization for probably the past two or three decades, but uh, over the past 10 years in particular, we've been learning more about something that's called affective polarization. And affect here is speaking about emotion. So how divided are we not in our ideas, but in terms of our relationships, our behaviors, and our feelings. And the literature about how divided we are ideologically is quite mixed. Um, there are every few years, there's another big paper by somebody who says that we are or, or we aren't polarized in this way. But when it comes to affective polarization, it's at this point, there's pretty much uh, a scientific and an academic consensus that we really are uh, polarized in this way. And an interesting thing about this is that um, when it comes to this, I'm going to go back here to the sociopolitical polarization, that means that maybe people see themselves as Republicans or Democrats in the states or as liberals or conservatives uh, in other places. 
um, if they see themselves as connected to these identities, that means they, they might see the other through a lens of hatred, through a lens of hostility, even if they actually have a lot that they would agree on ideologically. Um, so it's uh, oftentimes it's about this uh, identity that's, uh, that we get attached to and that's, um, that's starting to divide us. So when we're talking about affective polarization, there are a couple different components of this. So um, we have our emotions. Uh, so we would um, start feeling hostility towards the other side, no matter who the other side is. With perceptions, we can start having biases. Uh, we might start thinking that their evidence isn't so good, but our evidence is really great. Again, detached from the science, detached, not necessarily like uh, attached to logic, but um, our, our, we start developing blind spots when it comes to this. And the third is about behavior. And this is where it starts getting really dangerous. The further that we are effectively polarized, the more likely we are to, for example, discriminate against the other side, to believe that they shouldn't have democratic citizenship, um, to want to stop them in different ways. So um, this has actually led to a lot of different consequences in, uh, in both Canada and in the States. Um, we don't have uh, too much time here today so uh, we won't go into all the different consequences and the causes of this, but just to say that this is, uh, this is a pretty big deal. So one thing that's interesting about uh, all, of these, uh, all of these different components is that they're often bound up in our identity, as I was saying before. So if we start seeing ourselves as, um, as belonging to one community on one side of the divide, the stronger that those identities are, the stronger our uh, negative emotions, our distorted perceptions, and our hostile behaviors are going to be. Um, and yeah, so just I kind of said before, um, the more likely that the, the stronger we are, uh, the stronger our degree of effective polarization is, the more likely we are to disengage with the other side, um, to think that they're morally wrong, um, not rational, possibly depraved, um, and maybe at the far end to consider them a threat to human existence or flourishing. And this is what we call existential threat. So if our community starts seeing the communities on the other side as a threat to our way of life, this is when we really start digging in um, and uh, not wanting to, to compromise with that. And uh, we've actually seen this uh, even on something that is as, uh, like this is something we've seen in history with different wars, with different genocides. But we also see this with vaccine mandates. We also see this with uh, responses to uh, the, the Trump presidency. When, uh, when people are polarized in these ways, uh, they start seeing even these political outgroups as people who are outside the, the, the circle of our uh, warm and friendly uh, relations. So if we're talking about peace building and conflict, this is a, uh, this is a reality that peace builders are starting to take seriously. Um, it's quite connected actually to this idea of identity-based conflict, which for those of us in the room who are in the field of peace building, we might know quite well. Um, these kinds of conflicts are focused on values that seem non-negotiable. Um, it's very hard for groups to see the other side as a part of our common future. And it's really hard to resolve or to compromise on these conflicts. I actually read something the other day about how when we start having these values that are non-negotiable, and for example, I say, okay, so just compromise on this value um, in order to make, make it better for everybody, or we will give you some kind of material compensation, often, it often backfires. So people that, uh, that, that are asked to compromise on these, on these values really don't, uh, often really don't want to, unless there's some kind of symbolic compensation. So recognizing their narratives, um, doing some kind of symbolic gesture of goodwill. These are things that can help um, grease the wheels in these identity conflicts, but, uh, but are these more traditional bargaining techniques aren't really gonna work. And this is gonna be the same with, uh, um, with conflicts over vaccines or about public health or these other polarized conflicts over race, religion, gender, things like this. And some other interesting facts. Uh, did you know that ideological markers in the United States and other countries in the global north are starting to become the most significant cleavage? When I say cleavage, I don't mean that it has the biggest consequences. So obviously, the, especially in North America, people think about race and the consequences of race or racial discrimination. And there's lots of debate over um, what, the, what the numbers are for that. But, uh, but this doesn't mean that ideological polarization is uh, more consequential, just that the average person is more likely to hate somebody on the opposite camp, often because um, these hatreds aren't, um, there's no taboo about them. We're not, uh, we're not um, 
we're not trained to, to, to reject them in the same way that we are racism or sexism or things like this. Um, and often our rejection or acceptance of ideas uh, in the science is often linked with how effectively polarized we are. So for example, in, in counties in the States where um, when they're doing um, studies about COVID um, and people's likelihood to uh, wear masks or not wear masks, they found that in affectively polarized uh, counties, um, the Democrats and the Republicans or the liberals and the conservatives are more likely to uh, wear or not wear masks, the more effectively polarized they are. So even people who wanted to, uh, like who, so it's not, it's not based necessarily on the science, it's sometimes about which team we play for with, uh, with what we believe. And that goes for both sides. So that's basically about the, the polarization. Then we um, start getting into, okay, so if this is, if this is the fields that we have, what's peace building dialogue and how can it um, help? Uh, address some of these issues. So first, um, a lot of us in the room are uh, peace building experts, but not everybody is. So we, I just wanted to kind of throw out this general question of what dialogue means means for us. Um, a really classic definition is the meaningful and meaning creating exchange of perceptions and opinions. Um, that's also very vague, but um, it's basically these moments of contact um, often facilitated by these third parties. And uh, like Julia was saying before, some of these, uh, some of these moments of contact, they're, they're called track two. There are other ones other than that. Um, there's, uh, skip ahead. Yeah, so this classic track, um, track language in, in peace building, track one being these like official um, negotiation processes, track two being these unofficial uh, dialogues facilitated by a third party. Um, that are trying to often do some kind of creative problem solving. And then there's track three, which is this uh, more com like among communities and community members and on the grassroots level. So just that that's what we're talking about when we're talking about the different tracks. Um, but this is, uh, um, this is what we think about when we talk about peace building dialogue. What track are we, uh, uh, are we having our dialogue on? And this isn't the only way to think about what kinds of, um, what kinds of dialogues we have. There are like, there's also multi-track and, and other, um, other frameworks, but, uh, but this is, Ottawa Dialogue is specializing in track two, but we're also interested in saying, okay, so what, for example, what room is there to do track three dialogues in the same way? And uh, so track three is the space where I kind of have um, uh, more experience and I'll be speaking a little bit more about today. So um, there's different kinds of dialogue. Um, there's, a, there's dialogue that's uh, meant to uh, open up space for us to talk about our identities. There's this positional dialogue where there's bargaining, there's problem solving where we see um, the issue is a problem that we collectively need to solve together. Um, there's narrative-based dialogue that tries to see that tries to draw attention to the stories that we tell about the conflicts we have. So there's lots of different types within even within these these different tracks, and different facilitators are trained in different types, and often uh, they're trained in different uh, in different types of processes. Um, so the the point. Of, uh, of these dialogues. Often it's about building relationships. Again, it's about this problem solving. Maybe we want to create some joint action. We want to compare our narratives. We want to take a decision. Um, these are all different things that can happen inside, inside one dialogue. And if it's for peace building, it's usually trying to get at some of the reasons why the different groups involved are in conflict and whether or not there's another way out. So in the, um, in the, in the United States and in Canada, there are Besides peace building dialogue, there are different kinds of dialogues that are already kind of in play. There's bridge building, which is just basically focused on this track three level. It's about building relationships between people on either side of the divide. There's not necessarily going to be um, a kind of uh, decision at the end. It's about building relationships and meeting the other side. There's another type called deliberative democracy, and this is about um, finding ways to include people in more inclusive uh, governance processes. So um, how do we uh, take large amounts of people and democratically debate these different ideas so that we can um, uh, take decisions in a more democratic way? So rather than just voting for somebody and they make the decision, how do we include the opinions of more people? So there's a lot of great techniques about consensus and stuff, but, they're, but this, um, the downside to this is they're not really as, uh, um, that tradition is not really as aware of, say, for example, the, the different identity issues that are involved. And then there's critically informed, uh, dialogue approaches, which are focusing on issues of power, issues of oppression, issues of privilege, 
And these are the ones that the, the point of the dialogue is very set. It's about becoming aware of the different axes of, of oppression in the room. If there are people from more privileged uh, positions, they're often invited to um, learn more about the, um, the experiences of those who are underprivileged and those who are um, underprivileged, they're often, um, uh, fo like the focus is also to help invite, like help, help people kind of, um, Actually, there's different there's different purposes. So it could be about finding agency. It could be about um, finding your own story. It could be about um, um, finding a place within um, within this other majority world. So um, these different types have are all very much practiced in the in the states and in Canada. But what peace building brings to the table is um, are you kind of a more unique set of tools that are developed um in the context of violent conflict so again we have the we have the different tracks um and one thing that's interesting about the tracks is that often these come with what we call theories of change so for example if we take P, uh, this bridge building there's often no idea of how one um one dialogue between a certain group of people how this is going to be affecting um, society at large um, whereas when you have the tracks there's often okay so if i want to have a dialogue on track two uh, and I want the ideas to influence the people on track one, or maybe I want to do a dialogue on track three, and then the ideas are disseminated through the media. So there's already some like a better, like a more concrete idea of what we want to do with uh, with what happens in the dialogue. And there's lots of debates over what works and what doesn't work. But this is a framework that's very common in the um, in the peace building framework. Um, so uh, also other um, other common. Uh, tools or mindsets in the peace building dialogue sphere. We have like readiness and ripeness, um, which is how do we know when is the right time for a dialogue to take place in order to transform a conflict? If that time, that ripeness isn't there, what do we need to do to be ready for it? So some dialogues might take place for years, maybe even decades before the moment comes uh, that something can happen. But, they, but the purpose of the readiness is so that when that moment happens, all the different pieces are in place for the dialogue to help uh, the peace process uh, as it's as it develops. Um, there's also something called the mutually hurting stalemate, which is when we try to figure out what at what point are the different parties ready to talk? Uh, at what point do people realize that they that they're hurting too much to keep going like this? There's also this idea of transfer, um, which is when uh, something yeah, let's just go back to the track. So when something that happens on a track two level, it gets transferred to the track one level or to the track three level or to Hawaii society. These different mechanisms of transfer are a really big uh, area of research and practice within the peace building world. There are also different tools for trust and legitimacy building that have also evolved over um, decades of experience uh, with working with armed conflicts, not only with armed conflicts, but also with different kinds of groups. So you have um, governments which uh, might be more interested in saving face, uh, or they might need to preserve their own legitimacy in order to take part in a conflict. You also have maybe non-state armed groups that react really differently. And so um, how you build trust and legitimacy with different groups are gonna be really different. And so there's a whole wealth of history with that um, or how to be more inclusive. So how to get more marginalized um, sectors of society to the peace table. There's a huge conversation about that. Um, and that's again, a huge wealth of experience to be bringing into these conversations. So, Dialogue and polarized identities. How do we kind of bring these bring these together? So, um, actually, looking at the time, I might skip some of this stuff, but um, we just kind of go very briefly. So, some of the barriers to uh, to using dialogue in this socio polarized context, we have these. Um, there's this there's this um, trend that's called social sorting which is when all these different social groups, religious, racial, class, um, occupation, there's a certain kind of polarization where those groups start becoming more and more likely to be attached to one or two of these big liberal conservative mega identities. This is something that's been observed for a long time in the States and it's starting to happen in Canada. So if you take your different identity group, um, you, those groups are more likely to be part of one or the other. And that creates these increasingly homogenous uh, mega groups that uh, in kind of increase this affective polarization. 
um, there's also this desire to delegitimize the other side. So engaging with them is bad. Engaging with them is, is unjust. And so we can't do that. There's this suspicion of neutrality, especially when we're becoming aware of, uh, of different issues of justice or oppression or uh, different dynamics like this to try to bring people together for these neutral processes. And oftentimes uh, there's, there's a certain kind of facilitator and uh, peace building practitioner that really speaks about neutrality quite a bit. And some people are very suspicious of that. Um, and then obviously the if you want people to engage with each other in dialogue, a lot of people don't want to do that because instead they want to resist each other because they think the other side is dangerous or they want to defend themselves because the other side maybe is dangerous. Uh, and the perception of who, like, who is a danger and who is perceived to be a danger is a really, um, a really nuanced thing to, to engage with. So that's one um, aspect of it. And so there's all these different kinds of resistance and it's really important for us to realize that all these resistances aren't just a barrier. I know some facilitators who, when they see these different dynamics, they're like, oh, these are actually just problems that we have to resolve. These are, um, these are barriers that we have to overcome in order to have the dialogue that we know that people need to have. Um, I would claim that the resistance isn't a barrier. These are uh, expressions of people's lived experiences and they have to be taken seriously for, for what they are. And there's different dialogue approaches that say, you know what, if people don't want to, there are other things that you can do. So you can have dialogues inside groups um, that aren't ready to dialogue with each other. Um, you can, uh, for example, have a podcast where you have like two members of, uh, of each group or just one member, like in alternating conversations. So there's also different things that you can do to promote contact outside of the traditional um, dialogue context. And so when we're talking about evolving forms of track two, we're thinking about, okay, so what are the barriers in this North American context and what are ways that we can evolve or adapt to try to nevertheless create moments of contact and uh, exchange between uh, increasingly polarized groups. So then there's, um, we have these kind of the groups on the left and the right with different unique barriers to the dialogue processes. So if we wanna talk about the right and the left, we have a little bit of time. So we'll get into this a little bit, but not, not too much. Um, so when engaging with groups that are on the left, um, oftentimes there's a, uh, there can be this suspicion again of civility, of having ground rules for discussion, um, because if there's a group that perceives itself to be oppressed, being told to, to wait turns, to calm down, this can be something that's seen as very triggering. Um, there are also cases where groups that have more power use dialogue to, um, uh, to maintain the status quo. And so for some groups, dialogue is seen as a tool of the oppressor. Um, and then we have this really big debate about what's really more important to be discussing right now, polarization or um, historical injustice. And this is a, a giant debate right now because there is also this really interesting paper that I read recently where this person said that uh, um, often the preference that you have for dealing with polarization or dealing with historical injustice would really depend on say your race, your gender. If you're somebody from a more privileged group, polarization might be a bigger issue for you. But if you're somebody from an underprivileged group, justice might be a bigger issue for you. So this is something, this is a tension that continues to, to, to go on. And so facilitators who want to facilitate these processes are going to have to engage with these questions. Um, yeah, and so one way that we can do that is to incorporate feelings of threat or marginalization into the ways that we design our processes. How do we make people safe, feel safe? How do we empower groups that feel marginalized? Um, and how do we design our processes to, to accommodate these, these needs? And we have conservatives on the right. So there's this narrative right now that there's uh, this discrepancy of cultural power. Um, so, and this is a finding that's pretty robust in the, in the literature that um, people who are involved in the media, academia and popular culture, the people who are involved in these industries, they're mostly left or liberal. Um, that is kind of a, like the, the data is there for that. Um, whether or not that influences uh, what they do is another question, but um, for, for many conservatives, this is something that seems suspect and they feel that, um, that some of these structures are, um, are biased against them. There's also something that I call the credibility crisis, which is um, when we're talking about mainstream media outlets, you hear a lot at the time, um, distrust in the mainstream media, um, but also in public institutions, that the system is stacked against uh, conservatives, people on the right, or people who are um, outside of the mainstream. And so um, people who are promoting dialogue, they might be seen as a, a part of that institution. And in many ways, like depending on where our funding is from, if we're being funded by governments, we, we really are part of that mainstream. And so if we're wanting to work with uh, groups on the right who perceive themselves as being marginalized, we have to be aware that they see us as coming from a position of power um, and we need to tread lightly. Then there's the peace building liberal asymmetry, which is often also in peace building, there's, uh, there's a lot more 
um, liberal and leftist theory and uh, understandings of power or privilege, and that we may need to grade our language when we're, when we're speaking to uh, communities we work with on the right. So again, like learn when our language is partisan, acknowledge legitimate grievances, and uh, make dialogue more inclusive for that. These are some basic ways that we can try to try to engage with that. Um, so again, polarization dialogue doesn't prioritize all the different elements. It won't hit justice. It won't hit uh, um, consensus building. It won't hit um, this identity uh, de-escalation. It won't do everything. You know, um, not every dialogue will, but uh, different processes that focus on different things will all have different strengths. So I'm getting a uh, okay. So we have five minutes left. So then I guess. Um, why don't we, I can give an example actually from one of the dialogues that, that I was running in this context. We did a dialogue shortly following the Freedom Convoy protest, um, protests in Ottawa. Um, so this was an online uh, dialogue because it was still COVID time with participants from Ottawa, from Canada, and some from the States and elsewhere. Um, and just to seeing like, what were some of the things that we did and what were some of the results from that? Um, so just kind of four, four brief kind of questions out of the different questions that we did. So for example, some of our activities were describing how COVID affects their lives, what fears people have about the protests or about the response to the protests. What are people doing in my camp that is contributing to the problem? And then what's one thing the other side could say or do that would build trust or give hope? And so these were like, this wasn't the total um, a template for our uh, dialogues, but these are some things that the facilitator was, was using. And so a question like the, how has COVID affected your life? It affirms the commonalities of those who are present. It humanized people. It got us to talk or to share our stories. In fact, half the dialogue was just about this, uh, kind of building that rapport, allowing the, because when we have this affective polarization, when we have people who don't have much contact with the other side, we often start forgetting that each other is human. And so this is a really important aspect that's, uh, that, that helps to kind of reverse that and uh, clear the way for people to start talking to each other like human beings and not like memes or representatives of groups or uh, representatives of ideologies. We talked about what fears people had about the protests or about the response to the protests. We developed a common map of people's concerns, their identities, their needs. And so we went from the, these people's personal experiences to what are the different things underneath that that are informing their experiences. Um, another one was, what are people in my camp doing that is contributing to the problem? Um, this also got people out of this polarizing mindset. So, okay, so not just what, what, are, what are the things that the other side are doing uh, that's causing the problem, what are the things that I'm doing? So it's also starting to get into this collaborative problem-solving mindset, but it also identifies actionable steps that I can take on my side to de-escalate tension. So if I recognize the problems that are over here, these are things that I can address more easily myself uh, than addressing the things that are on the other side. So this also starts working towards the de-escalation. And then what's one thing on the other side that the other side could say or do that would build trust or give hope? So this gives the other side a map to do the same thing. It also builds us a, uh, um, a list of easy wins. So if there's, I don't know, 10 different things that they could do, maybe there's one or two that are easy that can be like these uh, symbolic concessions or these symbolic offerings that we can give to one another. So as we mentioned earlier, when we have these um, sacred values that we don't want to negotiate on. Um, sometimes something that helps create space in the in the dialogue to move forward are these um, symbolic acts um, where we feel recognized, where we feel seen, um, where we build trust and possibly work towards a way out. So I think that's uh, that's all that I have today. So um, obviously, there's it's a really big uh, a really big topic. Uh, a lot of this is very surface level. Um, we couldn't get into everything, but um, but yeah, we, we have some time for questions and for discussion. And so uh, let's let's move on to, to, into this uh, next section. Great, Josh, thank you very, very much. That was brilliant. I learned a lot and shocked at how <laughs> much I learned um, positionality wise being a, a, a Filipina Canadian um, immigrant myself. There are a few questions already in the chat. Um, so for those of you uh, who want to just add here, I won't reread them, but I'll refer to them or you can also raise your hand. And so let's collect a few and we have about 20 minutes, uh, so lots of time. Um, but I think, you know, if I could just say and, and use my role as a moderator here to just um, couch this by saying, it's really interesting um, with your experience, both in 
in this context and then also um, in the other contexts that you work in, I would be really interested to see if there were any qualitative differences between the work and, and why and why not. Um, then I'm gonna go over to Patty's question here. So maybe collecting a few um, about, you can read it here, but if I can use the word Patty of, of you know, how do we determine when outside actors or agencies or countries are influencing our governments and communities and then creating polarization to achieve their purposes. And you can read the rest of the question. So if I may mm -hmm. use the word instrumentalizing, um, what, what are the, what does that bring to bear? Um, and then what does that mean? And if you want to comment on that. Um, Nina also has a question or comment of the use of social media, also in a similar vein, to create or support polarization. That's a really huge dilemma in the field. Um, so the question of does big tech have a corporate responsibility to monitor and or to interfere, intervene with such discussions and, as an example. Um, now I have a question of how um, to shift the international gaze of peace building funders, agencies, let's say international Geneva, for instance, um, you know, how likely are they instead of providing funding for a dialogue in, in the Balkans or in Southeast Asia or Myanmar to fund the dialogues that you are doing? What are the barriers to that and why? And how can we overcome that to sort of shift the gaze a little bit? So maybe we can start with that, those questions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so then I think um, I'll start with Patty's question um, about what happens when there are these outside actors that are um, that are kind of involved and possibly even benefiting from uh, from the polarization that's uh, that's happening. And so again, this is one of these big uh, dilemmas that's in the field, and this is one thing that dialogue. So if if people's polarization are downstream from uh, political leaders or um, well-funded groups who are doing different things, it's very hard to compete with that first off. Uh, and we have to recognize the, um, the, the difficulty in that. Um, there's also, the way that I also see it is those actors are there and they're, they're giving the spark, but the base level of polarization is the tinder for that, uh, for that flame. Um, this is an idea that I'm still kind of exploring and so just take it with a grain of salt and so for me I think that one thing that we can do as dialogue practitioners is start working with this with this polarization before those sparks happen so that we can already alleviate this uh, effective polarization because if we're in a space where we're already at each other's throats then it just takes something like that for people to, to light that fire and so this is part of what we uh, of what we call readiness in in peace building and especially in track two uh, what do we need to do in communities ahead of time to um, to build connections with the other side to see each other as human um, before these crises happen. Um, obviously, this also kind of connects to uh, what Julia was asking about funding and how do we legitimize this kind of work. A lot of people uh, want to fund the crisis. So the other context where I'm working in right now is Ukraine and Russia. Um, and a lot of people want to fund the big thing that's in the news right now. Um, it's a lot harder to fund these readiness projects when really, if we funded more of these readiness projects ahead of time, uh, we might not have uh, these these giant issues. So even if we take about the, the Freedom Convoy, um, there are lots of people that would happened in, in Canada in uh, January, I think January, February last year. A lot of people were very upset about what happened or about uh, the response to what happened, but these were all issues that were growing for a very long time. And so for me, I'm interested in what dialogues can we have to um, to address those resentments and to resent those grievances before something like that happens. Because once the once the spark happens, the escalation keeps going and then it's much harder to get back down to, to earth. Um, and so um, also, Patty, you mentioned about uh, like in your face ideologies. And I think one of the best ways to counter the dehumanizing aspect of ideology is face to face contact and realizing that the other person has a story and focus on personal experience. Um, so those are just some ideas we don't have, we can't really get into all of that too much right now. Um, but, uh, but that's one, um, like, how do we like reduce the Tinder? Um, and also how do we, um, focus on, uh, on the human and humanizing aspect of, uh, of the work that we can do to, uh, to resist this dehumanization and the simplification of the other side to talking points that we then have to dominate or control or, um, or what have you. So then this also kind of goes towards Mina's question about social media. Um, again, social media is one of these huge outside factors. And so maybe there's some, uh, there's some regulation that needs to happen. I also just have to say that I was caught up in this at one point because uh, we were doing an online dialogue through our Kitchen Talks platform. 
Um, and uh, we were doing one about conspiracy theories uh, or things that are perceived to be conspiracy theories and particularly about QAnon. Um, and Facebook thought that my description of QAnon was a support of QAnon and it deleted my account. So I lost all of my stuff. And so like, this is a consequence of working in the social media field, you know? So it's like, it would be, I don't, I, I really don't have an answer to it, but I feel this question quite a bit. Um, I think though, that there are some, some ways to leverage uh, social media. Uh, for example, this is like, I've talked to Lauren and Julie about this before, but about, for example, podcasts, and there are different podcasts right now. There's some that are super polarizing, but there are some that are really kind of, that the host is almost more of a facilitator where they're kind of drawing out the human story. They're speaking for two or three hours um, and you really come away knowing like one side or the other. And some of these uh, hosts have like millions of views for these different, uh, for these different episodes. And so this is one way to leverage um, these new technologies and social media for, for those purposes. And that's something in particular that I'm really interested in with, uh, with some of my colleagues. Um, and then, uh, Julia, about your question about the, uh, about how do we legitimize this for funders? That's a question that I'm really interested in right now because we're seeking funding. So if anyone knows any big funders who want to fund this, let me know. Uh, that's, uh, a lot of this is how, like, is making this argument that, um, it's about prevention, um, rather than, uh, rather than treatment or rehabilitation after the fact. That's one, that's one way. But, uh, but now that we've had, unfortunately, these big polarizing events, so for example, January 6th, the Freedom Convoy protests, these are things that are in people's minds quite a bit. And so we're hoping to kind of say that, okay, so these things are happening and there are these different issues involved, like on either side with these, with these big events. This is what we need to, this is what we think we need to do in order to prevent worse, like, worsening of the situation in the future. So that's, that's another way, but um, I don't know, I'm, I'm speaking a lot and I'm also really interested in maybe hearing what other people think about these questions, what expertise you bring to the table or if you have any other questions. Laura. I was wondering if people wanted to get involved in their own communities in, you know, perhaps serving as like a bridge builder or supporting dialogue um, like, you, like you have done. Um, I guess I was wondering where you would suggest them to begin, especially in, like, I'm thinking about my own community, which is a very, very um, middle to working class Catholic community. And I feel like there's a lot of like religious literacy that is needed. And I can imagine in Canada, where a country so diverse, that religious and subcultural knowledge is also important. And I guess I was just wondering how you feel the training materials or the resources that you suggested, how they can be adapted because Canada's local context is just so varied. Great, thank you, Laura. And maybe let's uh, take another question from Patty there, I see, and anyone else who wants to come in. Let's see. Sorry, just unmuting my camera. Hi guys, uh, I just wanted to follow up to Laura's uh, suggestion. Um, a real life experience after the direct show in um, the spring here in Ottawa, we had my whole neighborhood, all the trees were down and the cost to uh, take all the trees out safely was enormous. I live in a condominium group and the cost was of course downstream down to the owners, which totally knocked people off their feet. And I could see people getting angry with the condo board. And uh, this was, you know, out of people's um, control. And I love my neighborhood, I love my neighbors, but the anger that was fomenting was so scary. And so I initiated a meeting and I had to go around to 71 homes to uh, get a consensus to have the meeting in order to hold it. Uh, the long story short, we still had to pay the thousands of dollars, each of us to pay for the removal of the trees, but, it enhanced that meeting uh, by being able to deal with the anger calmly and in a controlled environment and in a group so everyone could hear the information has been so successful. And I know more of the neighbors in my neighborhood and we're becoming a kinder group. So what Laura is saying about bringing it to your community is so powerful and so important. And just to go back to my concern about the polarization on socials, 
um, like, I'm a kind person, we're all kind people. And so when you are meeting people on social, um, the social world that um, post hateful things or um, polarizing points, it's like shocking to you to think that this happens and then people heap onto that. And it's so hard, Josh says, go person to person, face to face. But in those uh, communities, which I, uh, rely on for a lot of my professional uh, impetus. Um, it's like, I don't want to go on those communities anymore because they've been almost destroyed by that polarization. So I don't know what the answer to that is. It, do I just go and present a calm uh, alternative or my own personal perspective? Like that idea of bringing people closer together by hearing your humanity. And so anyways, I'll leave it there. I jumped in with two major issues, but thank you, Laura, for bringing it back to the community because that's where we need to start. There's people around us. So that was mine. Absolutely. Thank you, Patty. That was really powerful. Does anybody else want to come in with a comment or, or sharing something uh, or a question for Josh? All right. So let's maybe tackle those questions. Although I see Lena making herself visible. Do you wanna do you wanna jump in? Yeah, I just was typing, but maybe it's easier to just to say, you know, like this conversation about the convoy and the um, you know, like importance of face-to-face uh, -face interaction got me thinking about how the uh, COVID impacted actually. So convoy is actually a result of this, you know, the health regulations yeah, related to COVID because we had to actually live in social so-called social isolation, which actually was kind of like a physical isolation. But at the same time, even though you had connections through the social media, you know, Facebook and so on, it's not the same like you have connections face to face with people, right? So this is like escalation of all this, you know. So do you think like I'm, I'm just I'm just wondering in 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 times like that like like for example COVID pandemic because most likely something like this will happen in the future again because you know like you never know what kind of diseases coming out you know like in in a sense so do you think like Josh maybe social isolation so called you know like so called social isolation is not a solution in this maybe there is some different ways I know I know because if if you if you give I mean like if you separate people you know, like, and put them in the, in their own compartments. I don't know, you know, like problems escalate, you know, like it's obvious, right? So maybe, um, maybe you have some kind of idea in terms of, you know, like how can we mitigate this? Hmm. Thank you, Lena. All right, Josh. Um, so I'm definitely not a health professional, so I, I can't speak to what kinds of regulations we should or should not have in the case of a pandemic, but what I do, think made this isolation worse was the disparagement of the other side. So we saw this especially where there was a mainstream consensus about uh, vaccinations, about masks, about mandates, and people who are on the other side, they weren't just, uh, you know, told to, uh, told to get in line. A lot of them were on an identity basis, uh, disparaged, just dis uh, mocked, um, told that they were stupid for having certain concerns. And some of these concerns are very legitimate. I think so the, the moment where we start getting into delegitimization of the other side in order to achieve certain goals, like I think that also just, if there's already social isolation where like our resources are depleted, that's just going to be like, that's just gonna explode, right? Um, and uh, now that we're kind of out of it, there's a bit more, like, for example, we see these, these shifting things where, uh, First, and especially when this comes to social media, like sometimes it's it's good that social media companies try to uh, try to regulate misinformation, right? But sometimes they regulate things as misinformation that might actually be a legitimate point of view. So, for example, talking about the origins of COVID, first was forbidden on Facebook, and then it was allowed. Um, even speaking about certain issues might get you flagged. So, like those kinds of those uh, like the those those dynamics shrink the ground for like reduce the ground for nuance for conversation for things like this and that also kind of creates more social isolation that way because if people don't feel like they can uh they can speak or they can engage in this way like this can be uh this can be problematic but then we have to realize that there's two values here you know like this how do we protect and how do we also stay sane and so it's these 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 value judgments that are like super hard to, to regulate but i think again one thing that we can that we know for sure is when we start disparaging the other side or delegitimizing them this is when we start into this like really awful cycle um 
and uh, maybe they're now that we have space we're kind of looking more critically at some of our mandates it might be good if we discover that there was something that was done too much if the mainstream institutions that regulated that in that way if there would be some kind of symbolic recognition for example if there is if people realize that oh we shouldn't have done this maybe if there is some kind of apology or some kind of we recognize you that's really hard to do in a polarized context, but that might be something that also kind of de-escalates things after the fact. And unfortunately, a lot of things were done and maybe um, maybe all we have left is to try to mitigate some of those impacts. But those are, those are things that from this kind of dialogue polarization sphere can, um, uh, can contribute to that, which doesn't really answer your question about should we not isolate people or not, but these are things that make people feel more isolated um, that, and we can address those. I don't know, did other people have comments about that? Everyone lived through the pandemic, you know? I think that there are lots of stories here. I have not a comment, but I kind of have a part two question, if that's allowed. Go ahead. I was wondering if you could kind of give your thoughts on like the question of emotional labor, because um, like when I was working, for example, my background prior to Ottawa Dialogue was I was working in reproductive health space, which is uh, really, it's a service space, but it is also a highly politicized space, of course. And a lot of my colleagues, um, you know, when questions would be posed to them about, it's also a highly racialized space, who got access to reproductive care, who is forced to receive reproductive care they don't want, like sterilization. Um, or reproductive um, operations and things. And a lot of my colleagues that were Indigenous or um, BIPOC, when they were asked questions, they essentially felt that there was a stronger burden on them to explain certain things about the reproductive space, or even if they were asked the same questions, the nature was the context and the history of the procedures that we were talking about were a lot more emotionally burdening to them. So it was a big question of emotional labor, but sometimes it was difficult because it was a fine line between you don't want to like request additional emotional labor from someone, which is a burden solely because of really dark past in the industry, but you also kind of need to have a conversation if there's a disagreement or if there's a misunderstanding, or like you said, if there's a polarization, like for example, if you're asking a you know question to like a colleague who's indigenous about you know, well, why do, why do people have to have an abortion, you know, after mm. month four, you know, mm. that does put a, a burden on them and the context behind that, it puts a darker emotional burden on them just by virtue of the colonial past of reproductive mm. justice in Canada, but it's also like a necessary question sometimes. So I was just wondering how you navigate that question. And I also like that idea of emotional labor, I feel like really has become a big term in the past couple of years. Thanks, Laura. And maybe Josh, so um, answering this question and relating that maybe to a final word uh, before we close today. So I'm just going to let you have uh, that space before closing us. So go ahead. Um, so this is a huge question. and <laughs> We have three minutes left. Um, <laughs> uh, so this actually kind of goes back to this. Um, I'm really interested in this idea of like positive and negative peace. And uh, I was so obsessed with like positive peace. We all need to engage with each other. We all need to connect with each other. We all need to like build things together. Uh, when the other side of that is like, why would people want a negative peace? Why would somebody want to distance themselves from the other? Why would somebody want uh, to not engage? There are lots of reasons for that. One of that is for some people, it takes more energy, energy and effort to do that. For some people, it's they perceive the other side as dangerous or as threatening. And so to be in dialogue, it's much more emotionally taxing on them. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe they think the other side is a, a bad actor and is using the dialogue to manipulate them. So there's lots of different reasons why people want to have this negative piece instead of the, the, the positive piece. And so that's become a bit of an obsession for me because there's certain communities that I've worked with where I'm just like, the, I don't know, I, I didn't understand immediately why they, why they didn't want to engage, why they didn't want to have dialogue. And I had to learn that. Um, but unfortunately, part of the learning process is me asking them a lot of questions. Maybe they don't want to answer a lot of those questions because it's exhausting. Um, and I think coming from there, like, I do come from some communities that are also kind of, uh, that's, 
that have had different experiences and I also get exhausted talking about their experiences, but in a lot of ways, I'm like a white dude, right? So like I, coming up to somebody in a racialized community or then saying like, oh, tell me about all the reasons why you don't want to talk to me or like to talk to white people, you know? Like, it's just something that's like, there's, there's certain access points that I don't have into that, right? And so um, one thing that I think is really important is for people to be servicing communities that they know well and that they kind of know, not just know well, but they, they have, uh, they build relationships, they already have trust. It doesn't mean that you can only work with communities that you, uh, that you're already integrated into. But for example, um, if there are, um, like that's one place to start, instead of going to um, a community that has this very nuanced past and start kind of asking them to teach you things, maybe it's going to a facilitator from that community. Right. Or maybe also one thing that's interesting is sometimes some people might think that, oh, I feel resourced today or I feel resourced generally. Maybe I want to speak to some of those issues that make it hard for my community to engage. And so mm -hmm. I think this also goes to what you were talking about, Laura, with religious literacy in Canada. A lot of people don't know that religious literacy is a thing because they're they don't have that experience. And so maybe it's like, I come from like also a Catholic community myself. Um, and so maybe part of like, and this is something I see as a part of my work is to start talking about that. Uh, what does it mean to engage with, um, for example, the, the Catholic communities that were polarized during COVID mm. and some of them were and some of them weren't. Why were there those differences? And so um, that's one thing that I feel like I can contribute as somebody from that community. Um, and so, I don't know, there's just so many different ways to, to, to think about that, that question. Um, but when talking about this emotional labor, um, sometimes it's there. And I think a lot of it also has to do with like how resourced we feel. And uh, mm. like Lena said, during the pandemic, we weren't really very well resourced. Um, so I don't know, that's that's a huge conversation huge. for, yeah. So anyway, it's a huge so guess, conversation. Yeah. Yes. And the, we are yeah. just at the beginning of it. And I really think that your work is really bringing us in, in a new direction. Um, so, I mean, with that, Josh and, and everybody here, thank you for your active involvement. I encourage you to stay connected with Josh um, and with this series. You know, we talked a little bit about um, the impact of social media on these topics. So next week, we will be continuing that conversation focusing really on, on data and peace, what digitalization brings to bear on, on this field and what Josh was talking about. So with that, thank you everybody for joining today and please connect with us, uh, join our newsletter if you haven't already. Uh, thank you to Laura and Mariana who made this possible and uh, there's Peter waving and thank you to Peter, Lena and the rest of you on our team. Uh, thank you, Josh. <laughs>